Let's see what happens here. Um, uh, the title of, of chapter five is, the title is called Integration. Uh, uh, but another word for that is, uh, I might want to say is anti-differentiation. That's a good word. Look at that thing. Uh, <clears throat> anti-differentiation. Yeah, that's what we're, that's the new topic. And by the way, that's sort of, uh, this is sort of where calculus really starts. <laughs> You've probably heard me say that before. You know, when we start limits, we might say, this is where calculus really starts with limits. And then we get past limits and we do derivatives and that's where calculus really starts. But maybe this is where calculus really starts. Nah, it's all been calculus, but... But this is this is important uh, for the rest of your life. Um, what's the idea? Watch this. Can I? Let me try to present an idea to you. You know, here's a function um, called uh, called x squared, and here's another function. Um, well, anyway, so you know, if I wanted to talk about his slope at a certain point, like you know, at, at whatever, one or two, or just any old x. If I wanted to talk about his slope, that would be a... Thank you, that would be a derivative. Good job. <laughs> All right, I mean, the, the slope of this function at any point is the derivative. You know, what if, what if this was a different function? What if it was this function um, pushed up three, you know, which would be this picture pushed up three, which would kind of look like this, I guess. I mean, it's the same graph pushed up three, right? Maybe I'd call it g of x though now, and it's, it's x squared plus three. Are you following me? But watch something here visually here. So the slope at this point x is whatever the slope of the tangent line is, but what if you move to this new function? What'd you just say? It's the same. It's the same, he said. He thinks it's the same slope, but I mean, I mean, it, it's the same graph pushed up three. So wouldn't it have the same slope? Right. Oh, and I mean, it would. I, I'm trying to convince you that it would. What if you pushed it down 28? It'd be way down here. But, but, that, at, but at that point, it should have the same slope. You with me? I mean, it's just this parabola. Well, and one way to convince yourself is, you know, here's a, so here's a new guy that's, that's pushed down 28. But so one way to convince yourself that they all have the same slope at that point is what, what would be their derivative? So what would be his derivative? 2x. 2x. What would be his derivative? 2x. What would be his derivative? 2x. Yeah, good. All right. So they all have the same derivative, and then therefore they all have the same slope. I mean, it kind of goes with that idea, I guess, that the derivative of a constant is the derivative of a constant zero. is zero. I mean, that, maybe that's the idea here, that when you add this plus 3, I mean, that... Uh -huh. It makes the function different, but it the derivatives are the same. I mean, if so, any function, if it's just pushed up, this is true then for any function, not just these parabolas, but if it's just pushed up, it, it's really, it's not the same function, but it has the same slope. If it's just pushed up or pushed down, if you just add a constant to it. <clears throat> See, the, I guess the idea is, I'm going to give you a derivative now. I mean, the idea of anti-differentiation is I'm giving you a derivative now and asking you to come up with the function. So you were going backwards. I mean, it's back. It's anti-differentiation. <laughs> so we're going backwards. So now you, you, I'm giving you the derivative and asking you for the function. And what I'm trying to explain right off the bat, though, is that there's a little bit of arbitrariness in this. I mean... From the example I just gave you, I mean, if I said let's do his antiderivative, um, so if the antiderivative of this is a function called f, I guess, and what would it be? X squared. Okay, so somebody said x squared, but what if you said, if it, what if somebody said this? <laughs> They're also right. What if somebody said this? They're all, are you okay? 
-hmm. They're all the same, right? I mean, I'm saying what's his antiderivative, and, and what I tried to convince you of a second ago is that all these share the same derivative, so when I give you that derivative and ask for his antiderivative, which one is it? And by the way, it could be anybody in between there. Um, so there's millions of possibilities. So are you convinced of that? That when we do an antiderivative, there's a certain amount of arbitrariness. <clears throat> and so you think the answer is x squared. But technically, it's x squared plus or minus, or minus, plus or minus any number, some number. But it's a constant. That number's a constant. Mm -hmm. So this is what we do. We put a plus c. And by the way, the c could be negative, so I don't have to put minus. So I put a plus c, and the c could be positive or negative, and the c represents some arbitrary constant. I like that word. Uh, I'm going to use it again here. Arbitrary. Arbitrary constant. And so the process of anti-differentiation, first of all, it does that. It has this plus c. It has this certain arbitrariness. <clears throat> When we ask for somebody's antiderivative, we sort of get a family of functions. And look at this. We sort of get what we call this family of functions. Because it's, well, here they all are. It, it could be x squared plus 3. It could be x squared plus 0. It could be x squared minus 28. It could be x squared minus 14. It could be, there's a whole family of these things stacked up here. It, it, it's any... The antiderivative of 2x is this whole family of functions. And that'll be true for all antiderivatives. We'll have this arbitrary plus c on the end of these antiderivatives. Arbitrary plus c. Is that okay? I tried to make sense of it by asking you about these derivatives, how these derivatives are all the same. <clears throat> hey, uh, so that's it. Um, let's see. Could you do the antiderivative of this function? Look at this one. Here's a function called cosine x. Can you find his antiderivative? Uh-oh, now. Ooh, eh, eh, uh, okay, that's all right. I don't know. This is tricky, man. You're going backwards. I mean, you've been doing derivatives now for a couple months. Now we got to learn to go backwards. Let me think. The derivative of sine is cosine. cosine. So if someone wants the antiderivative of cosine, sine that's back to sine. I mean, if I know my derivative rules, this hopefully you learned your derivative <laughs> rules over the last two months because it'll make antiderivatives a little easier. But but the derivative, hang on, the derivative of sine is cosine. So if someone's saying do the antiderivative of cosine, sine. the answer is sine. No. The answer is sine. Okay. The answer is sine. Um, I'm going to use a big capital F here. Um, sine x. But you're right. Again, when you do an antiderivative, there's always this arbitrariness. There's always this plus c. <clears throat> I mean, there's a whole... Because you know this. If this was sine x plus 8, what would, he, what would be his derivative if it was sine x plus 8? Cosine x. Cosine x. What if it's sine x plus 7? I mean, right, you know about how to do derivatives, so hopefully this makes sense. When you do an antiderivative, you generate this unknown constant, this arbitrary constant. <clears throat> now, I just used a couple of funny different notations, um, but, <clears throat> but the notation is kind of going to be this. Um, so, you know, we've always started with a function and, and we've sort of said, let's take his derivative, you know, and we call that f prime. And we can do another derivative if you want, f double prime and, and so on. And, and if I gave you f double prime and said do his antiderivative, where would you end up? Here, right? If I gave you something labeled f prime and I said do his antiderivative, you would end up at f. But if I'm giving you something called f, and asking you for his antiderivative, then you're going up a level, you hear me? And, and then the notation, just for convenience, kind of, is a capital F. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna stop there. I mean, I'm not gonna build a ladder all the way up here. Uh, I mean, so it's the notation of, if I give you, so like over here, I was trying to, 
I gave you, I called it F prime. So what's his antiderivative? F. But even if I call it F, he might be somebody's antiderivative. He might be, this thing called F might be somebody's derivative. So I can find his antiderivative. If I do, I'm going up a level above F, and we call that capital F. So the idea then is that what if you took the derivative of capital F? Where would you be if you took the derivative of capital F? What'd you say? You'd be at lowercase f, yes, thank you. Right, take the derivative of him, you'd be here. Take the derivative of him, you call it this. Take the derivative of him, you call it this. Do his antiderivative, you go up this way. I mean, right, you could draw a little arrow here and you could say, this is differentiation going this way, and you could draw a little arrow going up this way, and this is anti-differentiation. Again, I'm sorry, I mean, I want to get down to the mechanics of how to do it, but I'm, I'm, I'm bogged down in a little notation here for just a second, trying to teach you the notation. <clears throat> in fact, so far, I've been just kind of walking up to you and say, hey man, can you find his antiderivative? I mean, I give you something, I mean, I did one there, I gave you another one here. Um, what, can you do this guy's antiderivative? <clears throat> What's his antiderivative? How did you do that? That's good. And by the way, I guess I'll call it F of, I'll call it capital F. That's the proper notation. Um, the antiderivative of F is going is, is capital F. That's what I just tried to teach you. But anyway, what did you just say it was? 3x plus C. 3x plus C. Good. And you can all, one thing cool about this chapter, if you're doing antiderivatives, you can always check yourself. How do you check yourself? Do his derivative. If you do his derivative, you'll get three. Cool. Well, you guys, the notation for this <clears throat> to ask you to do is this, and, and, and this might be more explained Wednesday, but it's this symbol. This is an, an integral symbol. And what we do is we say we're gonna integrate some function with respect to x. And, and we've kind of referred to this as, as an indefinite integral. Actually, indefinite integral. I guess it won't be too long. We'll learn a little bit about what's a definite integral. But don't worry about it right now. All right, so this is called an indefinite integral. And an indefinite integral is equivalent to doing an antiderivative. Antiderivative is the same thing. What did I say a second ago? I'm sorry. I said, yeah, I said that. I said integration is the same as anti-differentiation. That's what I said. I'm saying it again, really. But more specifically, this is called an indefinite integral. Is the same as this anti-derivative. And this is the symbol for it. This is an indefinite integral of a function called f of x. And, and you're integrating this thing, you're, or you're doing the anti-derivative. I'm going to say integrate. When I say integrate, I mean anti-derivative. So you're doing the antiderivative of f of x, and what's the answer? Again, thanks to my notes here, what's the answer when you integrate an f of x? Capital F. Capital F. So the answer is this capital F, because that's the antiderivative of f, plus c. This is sort of my new notation. So back to my using my new notation a few minutes ago, I could have just asked you, hey, you guys. This is, I mean, this is how I say, hey, you guys. What's the, what's the antiderivative of cosine? How did, how did I do it a few minutes ago? I just said, what's the antiderivative? I had to write the word antiderivative. Now, I, this is the symbol that says, please do the antiderivative of cosine. We already did it. The answer is sine, sine x plus z. <clears throat> hey, what's the antiderivative of 3x squared? That, what's funny is I haven't really taught you any rules yet. So I haven't taught you any rules. You're, what, so you, what you're doing out there is you're out there thinking about your derivative rules and how to work them backwards. That's what you're doing, right? So when I ask you for the antiderivative of 3x squared, you're trying to think about... See, that's a famous one, isn't it? Doesn't it look, seem famous? Yeah. Who's he the derivative? He's the derivative of somebody. Who's he the derivative of? X cubed. Yeah, x cubed plus c, you're right. Is that right, x cubed? Mm -hmm. yeah. you just, did you guys know that? You figured it out? You could, 
You just kind of did a derivative backwards in your head and figured out that it's x cubed. Again, after I say it, it's easy as hell. After I say the answer, can you double check it to make sure? Uh, yes, his derivative is this function, 3x squared. Right. <clears throat> well, good. You know, it's anti-derivative. It's the backwards, it's, it's, it's the opposite of differentiating. It's sort of the inverse operation of differentiating. You know, if you're multiplying something and you wanted to undo that, you might divide by something. That's an inverse operation. If something was squared and you wanted to undo it, you might square root it. That's the inverse operation. Well, if something's differentiated and you wanted to undo it, you would anti-differentiate it or integrate it. It's, it's the inverse process. It's a calculus process. It's not just multiply, add, or it's, it's, there's a derivative process, a forward process called derivatives, and a backwards process called antiderivatives. And it's hugely important. Uh, I mean, again, if we finish our course with, with, I mean, that's all chapter five is about, and then calculus two starts with plenty of this. Uh, calculus two is full of anti-differentiation, right? And its uses and how it's used and all kinds of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> let's see if, see if we can come up with a rule. So, if it's the backwards process of derivatives, see what was the what was the main rule of derivatives was this power rule. And the power rule is stated, you know, you bring the power down and and then you uh, subtract one from the power, right? That's the power rule for differentiation for doing a derivative. Okay, well, so now it's the backwards version of that. Uh, the backwards version of that for an integral. So this says I'm integrating x to the n. I'm doing the antiderivative <laughs> of x to the n with respect to x. This is, this is the notation that says please do an antiderivative. This is the notation that says please do a derivative. Dealt with that for a couple months. This is new. This is the notation that says, please do an antiderivative. So it's the backwards version of the power rule. Wait a minute. So instead of multiplying and subtracting one, I got to undo that and I got to undo it in reverse order. So hang on. Instead of multiplying and subtracting one, I'm going to I'm gonna add one. I'm going to add one to the power. And then instead of multiplying, I'm going to divide by that new power, that new power. That's it, you guys. That's awesome. That's the, that's the backwards power rule. That's the integration power rule. That's the derivative power rule. And this is the backwards version of it right here. This is it. This is it. This is, uh, I mean, this is, there's a lot of damn anti-derivative rules. Uh, but this is the first big main anti-derivative rule. It's the power rule backwards. Are you guys with me? <clears throat> Did it work on this one? Let's try it on this one. So if I did this power rule, pretend, remember you guys knew the answer, but for, pretend you don't for a second. Uh, <clears throat> I got some other things I need to teach you. One of them is you can hold the constant three, just kind of hold it out, and then I'm doing the antiderivative of x squared. According to the rule, you add one to the power and then divide by that new power. You add one to the power and divide by the new power. That's what this says. Add one to the power and divide by that new power. So, cool. I just did that. With the three out front, uh, and then you put a plus C out here, because then you're done. You put a plus C. So with the three out front, the threes cancel, and what's the answer? X cubed plus C. Right, so we knew that a second ago, but now I just officially did a power rule. Cool. This is cool. This is cool, you guys. I don't even realize how cool. All right, here, watch this. Let's do another one. Can you do, <clears throat> can you do this guy? <clears throat> so I want to do the, the integral of him. I want to find his antiderivative. I'm, I'm not doing it in my head anymore. I'm not trying to, and now I'm just doing the rule. The rule is this. It's a power rule. What's the power rule say? Add one to the power, divide by the new power. So it's easy. What's the answer? X to the fifth over five. You could also call that one fifth x to the fifth. That's of course that's the same thing. 
could talk either way, I'd talk either way. I'm just saying. But I didn't think. I just, I turned into a robot. I've been asking you to think for the first 10 or 15 minutes. I've been asking you to, can you think about the backwards version of a derivative? Anyway, now I'm saying, don't think, do this. Whatever, it's still thinking. You can tell you're doing the backwards version of a power rule, right? You're, I convinced you, you believe me, that this is how you do an antiderivative power rule. This is a good one, you guys. We did it. It was easy. Add one to the power, divide by the new power. It's done. It's over. Do you want to check yourself to make sure, to convince yourself? Go ahead and take his derivative. It kind of helps it all sink in, I think. If you take his derivative, you bring the 5 down, cancels with the 5, you subtract 1, and you get x to the 4th. Oh, by the way, you take the derivative of the constant, it's 0. So you get x to the 4th, right, which is there. His derivative is there. His antiderivative is there, right? You want to do a harder one? Try this one. <clears throat> well, of course, I'm going to do a power rule. Uh, but in order to do a power rule, you have to see it as a power. Maybe, maybe rewriting it is, is an option. Let's just rewrite this. We know what it is. We know it's x to the 1 half. But now I'm doing the opposite. The power rule I've been doing for two months is, is over. I'm doing the opposite of that power rule. Uh, I'm doing, I'm adding one to this. When you add one to uh, a one half, you add one to it, three halves, mm -hmm. and then divide by three halves. Listen to me, I'm dividing by three halves uh, plus C. In the future, this is about the last time I'll ever do this, when I say the words dividing by three halves, I'm not going to write that. I'm going to save myself a step because dividing by three halves is the same as multiplying, multiplying by two-thirds. Two <laughs> I mean, it's, it's I added one to the power, and then I divided by the new power. I, just wanted to, I did a power rule. But now I just want to tell you that we, we, all, we hate dividing by three halves. What we'd rather do is, mul this is algebra. Dividing by three halves is the same as multiplying by two thirds. So what are we doing? We're doing antiderivatives. We're rewriting it so we can see it as a power. We do our antiderivative power rule, and then maybe we clean it up and rewrite the answer by cleaning it up a little. You follow me? Rewrite the problem. Do the problem. And by the way, when you do the step, when you do the antiderivative, don't, don't write this symbol anymore. This symbol is saying, please do the antiderivative. Once you do it, that symbol's gone. I mean, you've done the antiderivative. There it is, plus C. It's over. Clean it up, maybe, like we did. You guys with me? What about this? What about the integral of a eight? <clears throat> I don't know if, I guess I don't really have, a, I don't have a rule for that. I mean, do I, have, uh, right, my rule is x to the n. I don't, I guess I don't really have an x to the n. Oh, unless I thought of it as x to the zero. Yeah. Do you guys think like that, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 don't admit it if you do. No. I don't know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So it's an 8. I don't really think of it as an x to the 0, an 8x to the 0, but you might. But it, and it, by the way, if you did, it would work. Uh, if, it, you thought, if you thought of it as 8x to the 0, then you could integrate it. What would you do? Add 1 to it? Yeah. Okay, first of all, you'd hold the 8 out, and then you'd add 1 to that. You'd get x to the 1st and divide by 1, and then you, you're done. The answer is 8x. I don't know. That's okay. That's totally fine. You can think about that like it's a power rule. I prefer to think of it as a number. And his integral is a number times x. Mm -hmm. I guess I prefer just to think like that. It's a, the derivative is a number times x. Because, no, his antiderivative, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> his antiderivative is a number times x. Mm -hmm. 
Because if you did his derivative, you would get the number eight, right? I mean, the, the reason for why is this, why is this this answer? The reason always is because if you did his derivative, you would get this. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the explanation for why we get these answers. <clears throat> if you did his derivative, it'd be an eight. <clears throat> Okay, what's the, what's the integral of this? I mean, right, who, what function has a derivative called zero? Oh, a constant. So this answer is just any old constant. Because if you did the derivative, I mean, so this is the plus C, just, just the plus C, just the C. Because his derivative, what's the derivative of a C? Zero. So what's the antiderivative of a zero? Some constant. Good, good. We don't know what constant, right. So what's the integral of, of this? Look at this one. The integral of a, of a dx, but, the, but what's really sitting there is a, is a one, I guess. So what's the integral of a one? No. Just an x? Yeah. Plus c. Okay. His, what's his derivative then? One. A one. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so there's some simple ones. Okay, very simple ones. So what am I doing now? I'm integrating a one. I'm integrating an eight. Yeah, pretty simple. I integrated a zero. Okay. But then there's x, x's, x to the first, x squared, x to the half, x to the three halves, x to the two thirds, x to the fourth. I mean, right, then there's power rules. <clears throat> All right, here's a couple more rules for you. <clears throat> and and, and we kind of, these are, okay. Uh, the integral of some constant k multiplied by your function dx is you're allowed to take the k out of the <laughs> integral and just integrate the function. So this is important, but this is a multiplied constant can kind of pass through the integration symbol. And then you just integrate the function. And the, the multiplied constant can sort of be pulled out front if it's kind of in your way. It's multiplied. It's a multiplied constant, not an added constant. A multiplied constant can be pulled out front of an integral. Okay, guess what? We used to do that with derivatives. We did that with derivatives. If we had a multiplied constant, we could slip past it and do the derivative of the function. So we had a, an analogous rule with derivatives that you could pull the constant out. Here's a something else. Here's another rule. Um, that if you have an integral of f of x plus or minus g of x dx, so now it's like I'm integrating a couple of separate terms. They could be added or subtracted, different terms. Guess what you're allowed to do? I mean, you can guess, but somebody has to tell you the rules. But you can guess the rules, and sometimes your instincts are good. I'm integrating two separate functions. What could I do instead? I can separate them. I can integrate f of x with respect to x, plus or minus integrate the g of x with respect to x. I mean, maybe it's so obvious you don't even want to write the rule or consider the rule, but it's an important rule. And it, maybe it's not obvious, so it needs to be stated. So... What, is, what does this say? I would say it, it says this, that if you have a couple of functions added together, you can integrate each function separately. Each function separately. <laughs> you can integrate each function separately. Mm -hmm. Another way to say that is these are separate terms. You can think of these as separate terms, and that's the right word. When they're added or subtracted, they're called terms, and you can integrate separate terms separately. <clears throat> and you can pull constants out front, and so... Let, let's put all that into one kind of problem. Watch this. So now, can, now with those rules added to this rule, you are pretty powerful. Watch. <clears throat> can you integrate this? I mean, that's a big, long polynomial. Can you integrate it? <clears throat> or anti-differentiate it? And what you don't do is you don't, you don't do it all at once. You do each term. That's what this says. This says you integrate each term separately. So you would treat him like his own little function and integrate him. Integrate him, integrate him, integrate him. You do four separate little integrals. 
Now you do that in your head. Please, I don't really want you to write that. Do you want me to write that? No. See, the rule tells me to write it like that. Listen, don't do this. Do not do what I do. Oh, I can do separate terms. Okay, I'm going to integrate the x cubed with respect to x. And then I'm going to integrate the 5x squared. Oh, and by the way, I can pull the 5 out front. And then I'm going to integrate the 6. Oh, by the way, I can pull the 6 out front. And then I'm going to integrate the 7. I can pull the 7 out front. Of e. So look, it's four separate little integrals. So I did this rule where I'm allowed to separate it. And then I pulled the constant out front. Now I'm ready to knock out a bunch of power rules. Are you with me? <coughs> Help me, please. What's this answer? X to the fourth divided by four. X to the fourth divided by four. According to the power rule, this is X to the fourth divided by four. Plus, all right, let's ignore the five for just a second. You're integrating at X squared. According to the power rule, X to the third, X to the third divided by three. The multiplied five is still sitting there. Multiplied out front. Uh, over here, you have a 6. I'll just put the 6 out front, but what I'm really doing is I'm integrating an x. Integrating an x. x squared divided by 2. x squared divided by 2. Is that right? You add a power to it. Mm -hmm. You add one. x squared divided by 2. And then finally, there's a 7 sitting there, and you're integrating a 1. When you're integrating a 1, you get x. x. Oh, you know what? Mm -hmm. I forgot. Maybe on each of these little integrals, I should have had a plus C. A plus C on him, a plus C on him. Might have been a different C, by the way. Maybe I should call this one C1, C2, C3, C4. But in the end, they're all arbitrary constants. And you can take C1, C2, C3, and C4 and just add them up and call them C. C. So you with me? You don't really do four individual constants. At the end, there's a big old plus C on the end of this. Thank you. Cool. We're done. Um, I do like these slightly cleaned up. Is there any cleaning you could do? I mean, not much. You call this one fourth x to the four. I mean, or just leave it like this. Five thirds x. I mean, there's nothing to do except right here. You can call that a three, right? Six divided by two. Anyway. Sorry. I know. What did I say? I just taught you how to do it. And I said, don't write this down. What a weirdo. Um, Here's what I meant. What I meant was, I tried to illustrate these rules for you, how you separate each term and do separate little integrals, and how if you have a multiplied constant, you pull it out front and then multiply it back. I tried to illustrate these rules with, with what I just did. The truth is, the way you do, these, the way you do this problem is you kind of do those rules in your head as you go. I mean, what you really do is you, you, without writing this four separate integrals, you just do four separate integrals. And without, what? Well, so I just, here's how I really do it. I just walk up to him and I do one fourth x to the fourth. <coughs> Bless you. I walk up to him and without writing that I pull the five out, I just mentally pull the five out. And I get x cubed over three and then put the five back. You, are you listening to me? You hear what I'm saying? I mean, this is how you really do it. 5 thirds x cubed. What about him? x squared divided by 2, right? x squared divided by 2. Don't forget there's a 6 out there. So when you divide by 2, it's negative 3x squared. Finally, you integrate him. That's a 7x. Don't forget at the end, put a big old plus c. Are you following me? You inter I did four separate little integrals in my head. I pulled the constant out and put it back each time. And so you don't really have to write this all out. I did it one time. Am I ever going to do this again? I did this one time to illustrate the concept. Maybe there, there's times where I do write this out, but not on a simple one like this. On a simple one like this, there's no reason to write this thought process out. But this is the thought process in my head. I'm doing four separate little integrals. I'm pulling constants out, and I'm doing power rules. You hear that, right? I, talk, I know I talk fast sometimes. <coughs> Four separate little integrals, pull the constants out, and do little power rules. <clears throat> cool, cool. That's awesome. So those are awesomely important rules, but you won't see me writing them down too much. Or, I mean, I don't know. I'm using them kind of in my head a lot. <clears throat> Along with the power rule, uh, 
What other rules do I have to tell you? <clears throat> that might be about it. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, all those trig rules. <laughs> so we had six trig rules on how to do the derivative of those six trig functions. What's the derivative of sine? Cosine. Thank you. What's the derivative of cosine? Negative, Negative sine. sine. What's the derivative of tangent? Secant squared. squared. What's the derivative of cotangent? Negative cosecant squared. What's the derivative of secant? Secant x tangent x. What's the derivative of cosecant? <laughs> Negative cosecant x cotangent x. I mean, there's six of them. Six yeah. derivative rules we memorized. Yeah. Well, now, I might have to mem well, if I memorized them, yeah. which it sounds like you did a very good job of. If you memorize those six <laughs> rules, now you've got, you got them already memorized. You've got your antiderivative rules memorized. You've got to go backwards. I mean, we kind of did it already today, but what's the integral of a cosine? It's sine. Because the, hang on. See, I, yeah, right. Because the, what's the derivative of sine? Cosine. cosine. So what's the integral of cosine? Sine. sine. Cool. What's the integral of a sine? It is negative cosine. Maybe I should look it up like it's its own rule, but it's really just the, it's the derivative rule backwards. Hang on. What's the derivative of cosine? Hang on. The derivative of cosine. Negative sine. Negative sine. So if you were trying to integrate a sine, you would get back to you would get back to cosine, but it would need a negative on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did I explain that for the crap? What's the integral of tangent? Okay, this is a trick question, sorry. When nobody knows the integral of tangent. I think I, Cal 2, or maybe I can teach you in Cal 2 what, how to do an integral of tangent. Oh wait, no maybe, no, maybe later this chapter I can figure out how to do it. But do you understand? I can't do it right now because tangent is not somebody's famous derivative. Is, is tangent a derivative of somebody? Mm -hmm. Not famously. Mm -hmm. Okay, hang on. Don't get confused. Wait a minute. Listen. Fo listen. What is the derivative of tangent? Secant squared. Secant squared. Okay, so if somebody said integrate a secant squared, that's what I want. I want that question. I don't want this question. I want somebody to say, please integrate a secant squared. And that might look difficult to you, but secant squared is a famous derivative. So he has a very famous antiderivative. It is tangent. tangent. So it's just memorized because we know our derivative rules. We know our derivative rules. So we know these, we know these antiderivative rules. <coughs> Are you with me on this? By the way, there's three more. Get pissed off. So if I'm integrating a cosecant squared, I think that's I, that's the derivative of cotangent, except it needed a negative sign, so I'm going to put the negative sign here. Then, all right, listen, I'm going to check myself. What's the derivative of cotangent? The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. With that negative sign on it, it's going to make it positive cosecant squared. Perfect. So his antiderivative is this. What's the antiderivative of secant x times tangent x? I mean, that looks crazy, it looks weird, but it's not crazy or weird. He actually was somebody's famous derivative. Who He is a derivative of somebody famous. Who is that famous somebody? Brad Pitt? No. Secant x, right. <laughs> what about uh, cosecant cotangent x? I mean, that looks wild, right? Looks wild. Dude, you're crazy, man. You're crazy. But I ain't crazy. That is somebody's famous derivative. It just ain't that famous. Y'all don't, you know, it's B films and stuff like that. It's, uh, it's cosecant x, and it's negative. Negative cosecant x. 
Y'all didn't memorize this one probably, did you? The derivative of cosecant was always negative cosecant cotangent. Right. It was. Just memorized. <clears throat> so the antiderivative of cosecant cotangent is negative cosecant. So these are six famous integrals you know, believe it or not. It's just your derivative rules backwards. <clears throat> I, what would you say? I don't know tangent, and I don't know secant by itself. I don't know cosecant by itself. Maybe later this chapter I'll figure out a technique on how to figure it out. But right now, today, I don't know. There's some stuff I just don't know. Right, let's keep going here. What's the derivative of natural log? You were supposed to do the. What's the derivative of natural log? One over, one over x. Good job. The derivative of natural log is 1 over x. Okay, so guess what the integral of 1 over x is? Natural 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 natural. Ln of x plus c. The ln of x plus c. I think we need absolute value on that thing. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. You do. So here's another rule. It's got to be positive. Yeah, got a couple more for you. Hang on. I, 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 this just triggered another thought here. Look at this guy here. I'm sorry. I, don't, I shouldn't have. I, I think this comes up later. I don't know if this is even presented in 5.1. I'm in 5.1 presenting a lot of this to you. I mean, there's no reason to save it for later, but, but, but anyway. It's in 5.1? Okay. Yeah. All right. Check this out. Look at this guy right here. You guys know how to do this one? And, and I didn't mean to. I'm probably misleading you. Don't even look over here. because It ain't about log. It ain't about. I guess it just made me think of something. I just put the x over here. Yeah, the only way to do this is a power rule. And your power rule, when you were presented your power rule, it looked like this. It was an x to the n, and it wasn't 1 over x to the n. So you don't do power rules in denominators. You do power rules when they sit here and look like this. So I think I have to manipulate this and make it look like an x to the n. How do you make it look like an x to the n? Thank you. Now it looks like an x to the n. I have to move him up and look. Now it looks like an x to the n, and now I can do my power rule. How does this power rule work? You add one to it, right? Remember? Right. So the answer is x to the negative two, to the negative two when you add uh, divided by negative two, negative two plus c. It's okay, it's just another power rule, but I'm dealing, I'm doing a negative exponent. You could clean it up. She's right. How do you clean this up? Uh, the 2 stays where it's at, but the x squared gets moved to the denominator? Yeah. So a negative 2x squared plus c? Yeah. You can get a negative x. I'm happy with that. Check this one out, you guys. Watch this one. This is a cool one. You ready? Oh, good job. You're right. You're right. Right? See, when you see a 1 over x, see, I, 1 over x is somebody's famous derivative. It's the derivative of natural log, so the answer is natural log. You're right. You're totally right. What if you thought for a minute that you could do a power rule like I just did? On this one, you do a power rule. Look, this is not natural log. Dude, this is not. This is power rule, and we just did it correctly. This one is not a power rule. The power rule fails. Let me just show you why it fails. Uh, move it up. Call it x to the negative 1. Okay, now add 1 to it. Adding 1 to it is not a problem. x to the 0 is really not a problem. But now you're supposed to divide by 0. zero. That's a problem. You can't divide by 0. Yeah. So the power rule fails just for this only, this guy right here. A 1 over x to the first or an x to the negative 1, the power rule fails because it's undefined. This is, this is bad, 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 bad. So this is not a power rule. This is, he's got his special own antiderivative. It's uh, the natural log of x. Right? Rule. We got a bunch of 
bunch of trig rules. We got this log rule. Oh boy. All right, listen, we got one more too. I guess we got e to the x. <clears throat> listen, what's the derivative of e to the x? E to the x. So what's the integral of e to the x? E to the x. Yeah. Plus c. Right. So watch this. This is everybody's famous favorite integral. You ready? This is everybody's favorite integral. See it? <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I know. It's, it's a bad word, but. No, it's not. It's not a bad word. <laughs> Sorry. But it is everybody's favorite. Whatever. <clears throat> Could be your favorite integral. Um, the reason it's your favorite integral is not because of what you're thinking, you bunch of weirdos. Uh, the reason it's your favorite integral is because when you integrate e to the x, you just get e to the x. Because the derivative is himself, so his antiderivative is himself. Right. If you start, if you think about this, you might get distracted. So. But I do like to pretend it's everybody's favorite integral. Um, <clears throat> there's there's another way of talking. I'm going to talk like this for just a second. Solve the differential equation. All right, now look, you, I don't even, you don't even know what a differential equation is, but I'm about to, this is a differential equation. dy dx equals <clears throat> 4x dx. I mean, 4x, I'm sorry. Okay. All right, so it's, it's called a differential equation because it's an equation with a derivative in it. And you solve it if you can find the function y. We're trying to find the function y. So watch this. I'm going to separate my dy and dx, and I'm going to multiply dx over to this side. And that sort of resembles what we studied at the end of chapter 4. Yeah. But I'm not really going into that area. Now, I want to get y, and so I think I want to integrate both sides of this equation. It's kind of like algebra, except mixing a little calculus in here. I'm taking the, the antiderivative of both sides of this equation. Now watch this. On this side, you know, the dy kind of says you're, you're doing this with respect to the variable y, the, and you're integrating a 1. Now, so when you integrate a 1, what do you get? Y. You get y. Good. Bless you. And that's what we're after. When someone says solve the differential equation, we're trying to we're trying to find the function y. We're trying to find y. So cool, we kind of got y. All I got to do is integrate the other side. Uh, it's easy. It's a power rule. So square x squared. squared. Okay. Divide x squared divide by two. Mm -hmm. And if you divide by two, x squared divide by two. If you divide by two, you get two x squared plus c. Okay, this is the answer to the differential equation. We just solve the differential equation. I mean, there's a whole course called differential equations. Actually, there's three or four courses called differential equations. So this is the most baby differential equation you can have, but you integrate both sides and you actually solve the differential equation. But when you solve it, you're looking for this function. I want to show you something. What you just found, again, is sort of a whole family of functions. Because what is this? It's a, it's a parabola, <clears throat> but it's a whole fan. I mean, the plus C could be, if the plus C is a zero, it's this parabola. If the plus C is a one, it's this parabola, pushed up one. If it's a two, it's pushed up two. If it's a negative three, it's down three. I mean, what this is, is it's, it's this whole family of functions depending on what C is. So what they might say is this. Solve the differential equation and find the answer that goes through, watch this, that goes through 
the point. <coughs> it goes through the point. Um, oh, okay. <clears throat> um, I want the one. I want the one that goes through the point uh, <clears throat> two, three. So there's a whole family of parabolas here, infinite number of parabolas. I want the one that goes through the point two, three. So I want to find that guy right there. So at the end of this, I got this big family of functions. If I want the one that goes through the point two, three, any suggestions? Just plug in for x, y. Oh, plug in the two for x? Uh-huh. Plug in the three for y? Yep. And maybe you can find c. And then that'll be your specific one. Instead of having a whole family, you, right. If it has to go through the point two, three, then y has to be three, x has to be two, and maybe we can find c. Uh, that's an eight. Is that an eight? That's an eight. If you subtract eight, this is negative five, c is negative five. Uh, we just found them. It's not the one I pointed at. It's uh, more like this one. <laughs> uh, but here it is, right, it's, it's, what is it? So now I got y equals 2x squared minus five. Listen, when it's this family of answers, it's called a general solution. When we, when we find out which one, which point it goes through and we get a specific answer, now it's called a particular solution. Particular <coughs> solution. Solution to what? Solution to the differential equation. Look, this was easy a second ago. It's starting to get more complicated with these words, but it's not no big deal. Mm -hmm. When you first solve a differential equation, you probably got this plus C in there and you got this general solution. If someone gives you a point, then you, they're, at, they're looking for a specific member of this family. And so we plug it in and we find C and now we have a specific member of this. We have a particular solution. So there is times when you can find C if, the, if you're given a condition like this. <clears throat> given that, it, what did I say? Goes through the point, I never did say, two, three. But. <clears throat> I added that to the question. First it was this question, and there's the answer. If you add this to the question, then there's a little work to do at the end. Find C, and find the particular solution. <clears throat> There's a lot other cool things to say, but maybe I'll shut up here for a minute. Um, let me hit pause. I want to give you back your test. I want to.